good morning everyone and uh, today i mean i am personally feeling very happy and uh, i extend a very very warm welcome to dr john uman warm in the sense because he's just wearing a half sleeve shirt and i'm feeling very cold looking at him <laughs> but he feels uh, the cold is very very tolerable a very warm welcome to sir to be able to travel all the way to delhi uh, from odisha or from south india and he has traveled back but he has accepted our request to deliver a lecture physically here which i am personally very grateful for him and he comes with a plethora of experience and i was hearing his stories just some time back and it really fills me with a lot of pleasure and uh, with a lot of passion also to do things in a different way maybe to look at research work also in a different way with what we have been doing and sir being in nmr and you know this institute much more than anybody else i feel and all these is a younger generation and uh, you have been interacting with mrc of the older years from all these previous years so i welcome sir and uh, dr john uman for the audience uh this is i'm going to give a very short history and and the brief bio but i'm sure his experience and expertise will not suffice here dr john uman did his mbbs and md community medicine from cmc vellore and has served at the christian hospital bisam katak raigada district in south odisha for over 30 years beginning as a junior doctor and retired in october 2022 as medical superintendent he is presently working as an honorary consultant at the hospital his main area of work has been the team leader of mitra madsons institute for tribal and rural advancement community health program of the institute working with the people of 54 predominantly tribal villages towards the dream of health education and dignity for all since 1995 the mitra team has been engaged in community malariology seeking to combat endemic malaria through community based efforts evolving ideas and approaches that have fed into policy and strategies at a wider level previously dr uman has served as a member of the india country coordinating mechanism of global fund for aids tb and malaria representing the constituency of civil society organization working on malaria 2015 to 2018 member of the national malaria task force government of india malaria task force government of odisha public health expert and on the technical and management support team odi odisha health sector plan government of odisha from 2008 to 2015 He is at present a member of the scientific advisory committee of ICMR RMRC Bhubaneswar and NIRTH Jabalpur vice chairman of the council of CMC Vellore since 2018 and chairman of the Asha Kiran Hospital and Society Lamtapur Korapur district Odisha His main areas of personal interest are communication in health community health and primary health care community based malaria control and health ed- health and education in tribal communities he now looks back on the stories experiences and lessons learned through decades of work in the community i am so happy to have you here sir and with malaria you know there for mal- elimination by 2030 i think today's lecture will give us a glimpse into the past and a pathway for the future and i mean that's how the wisdom and the uh, all these years uh, ga- gathered knowledge of senior people like him should be utilized best for the floor is open to you sir thank you once again um, thank you uh, dr manju and uh, thank you to sachin who is not here the two people who contacted me and um, brought me here thank you so much for having me uh, all of you here in nmr and in mera india it's i'm absolutely humbled and privileged to be here um i just get my presentation on the board sits there it's there yeah right just keep some papers with me just in case yes sir. in case you ask me a question i can't answer i'll have to refer to something huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me i have um, i was worried that what i have to say may or may not be relevant to you uh, but i come here as a consumer of the research you do uh, you work on pursuing uh, the truth in malaria but you don't have the advantage i have of utilizing that information in the field and i'm very grateful to you for allowing me to share these stories to give back something to the people who generated the knowledge that we use um 
like my friends told me distinguished lecture this is i am more extinguished than distinguished so i a little worried about that bit but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for having me and i'm going to try and share stories from the last if 25 sounds good it's a little more than 25 but 25 sounds better than 27 and a half or something like that no so i'm going to try and share some stories and i hope these will be useful to you um you know i have to make sure i get this right which one do you know? okay yeah so i sit here today to repay a 27 year old debt to NIMR, MRC as we knew it then. Um, in 1995, I came here to Delhi searching for um, information. Uh, MRC, Madhuvan, Dr. Sharma, VP Sharma, but Kingsway Camp was my hunting ground, Dr. Adak and others there. That's where I would go every year, sit down with them and say, please teach me. Uh, what is new in malaria. I need it for my people. So VCRC, WHO, CRO, NMEP, now NVBCP. I came saying, I come from South Odisha. Too many of my people are dying. Please teach me, what should I do? And that was my only reason for coming into malaria. One third of our deaths was at that time malaria. But I was received so warmly by the scientists, uh, scientific community. They couldn't understand why I was so interested. <laughs> They gave me a copy of Ramachandra Rao's Anopheles of India, which I think is like, wow, I, I couldn't believe there was such information available uh, because the people who have the information don't get malaria. The people who have malaria don't get the information. In 1995, uh, I actually sent a letter to uh, the Director General WHO Geneva, <coughs> uh, only two lines, dear sir slash ma'am, you have the books, we have the malaria, can we exchange? And I sent off a letter, and I don't know who the director general is, but they sent me two books uh, with best compliments, and that's how I started my malaria library. There was no internet, there was no source of information that we have so much access to now, and we were searching. But I'm so grateful because every bit of information that MRC and WHO and VCRC and NMEP gave to me, we were able to take back, demystify, change it into a language that can be used by the people who get malaria and try and create a response that I would like to call a people's movement against malaria. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So I come to say Guruji Pranam to all of you who are the gurus of malaria. You know, I've done hundreds of sessions on malaria under mango trees in movie theaters and stuff, but I've never spoken to a group of malariologists who know more about malaria than I do. So I'm a little nervous, but I come to say thank you. And I want to take a few names when I start, because if you don't understand your yesterdays, you're going to mess up your tomorrows. Dr. Valerie Orlov, my guru, the first person who took me seriously. Uh, he was here with CRO, WHO, a Russian malariologist who understood India's malaria perfectly. And of course, Dr. VP Sharma, there's nobody I've heard speak about malaria the way Dr. Sharma could speak. He, he understood the issues. Dr. Adak, Dr. Batra and Dr. Mittal, who came to us from uh, MRC back in 1996, spent time with us to help us understand malaria. Dr. C.R. Pille and Dr. Usha Pille, the, they looked after the parasites in their parasite bank as if it was their own children. Literally, <laughs> Usha's blood was used to uh, feed the parasites sometimes when no other blood was available. They also came, to, uh, Dr. Pille also came to Bismarck to help us understand what we were doing. VCRC, Dr. Jambalingam, Dr. PK Das, Lalit Das, Sadhanan, who did his PhD in our area. So we would steal all their information by going with them on the mosquito collection rounds in the night. Mm -hmm. And that's how we learned mosquito behavior. And Dr. S.S. Sahu, who I think has contributed so much to Odisha's understanding of malaria. And in NVBDCP, especially Dr. Neeraj Dhingra here in Delhi, and Dr. M.M. Pradhan, uh, who I'll come back to later, who has done so much for Odisha's malaria. So I'm just putting some names there because uh, for me, I want to tell you that you guys have the information, you know, you're the, you're, the, you're the purists, you're searching out there, but there is a relevance to what you are doing, which I hope I can encourage you with, to bring back that perspective, that passion in malariology, and that's what I'm here for. And so here's my Guru Dakshina, stories from the field, learnings from those stories, and reflections on the art and science of community malariology. Uh, let me try and introduce the context I speak from. I come from a place called Bisamkatak. 
Bism Gadak is in South Odisha in Raigada district. We used to be called Koraput before. We are uh, 200, 400 kilometers from Bhuneshwar, 350 from Raipur, and 250 from Vizag. So it's the Bermuda Triangle. It's in the middle of the, uh, everything is far away. But a beautiful part of the country. People pay money to see such places. We get it for free plus a salary as bonus. So, I mean, you can't ask for more than that. It's such a lovely place to be. Uh, I work at a hospital called the Christian Hospital. It started in 1954, 68 years ago. A Danish lady called Liz Madsen came there. That was her first clinic when uh, the first patients had to be admitted and there was nowhere else to put them. Starting from there to what it is today, uh, where it has grown over time. I first joined there in 1987. So I've been there for about half the life of the institution thus far. Um, it's 200 beds. Pre-COVID, uh, we were running at 105% bed occupancy. I'm just trying to get you a feel of what the work is like, because that's the context from which I speak. Um, we had lots and lots of surgery. 16, if you take that 6,000 surgeries divided by 365, it comes to around 16, 17 surgeries a day, about 12 deliveries a day. You go into college uh, training nurses, you go into education, it is inevitable. Because if you are in a place like that and you want to make a difference, you have to go into education. Nothing changes the power equation like education does. My own personal passion is in community health. Um, I was telling Dr. Manju, I uh, joined there in 87, after my MBBS, I trained at CMC Hello. They have a good system of sending you off for two years, go serve before you're allowed to be called, you call yourself a doctor. I landed there for my second year, epidemic of meningococcal meningitis. I had never heard of such a thing. Uh, I slept in those classes probably. Um, and uh, I realized that for every one person who makes it to hospital, uh, 99 probably die in a village. And the denominator is never looked at. We in India are numerator people. We are not denominator people. Um, we, we take great pride in what we do. We never ask out of how much. And uh, epidemiology is the science of the denominator, the science of patterns. Uh, and so this is what pushed me. Uh, we were working with 38 predominantly Adivasi villages, up to 54 now. We started the way we normally do things, but over time we realized, um, you know, development is trying to make other people like yourself. We don't say it, but that's what we do. And with a tribal community, that's dangerous. And so we went to community dreaming sessions, and this is now the dream that we work with. A dream that one day everybody will be healthy. A day will come when everybody is educated. A day will come when there's no more poverty, no more hunger. A day will come when everybody can live with dignity regardless of caste, color, creed, and so on. So you convert those into indicators, and you get the MDGs, basically. Uh, that's how we work, uh, and that's what we play with. So my initial years were totally in the field walking from village to village, sometimes 10, 20 kilometers a day, such fun, carrying a knapsack full of medicines, another knapsack full of samosas to keep you going till the end of the day. And uh, the beauty and joy of working with the community, of learning language, learning culture, and becoming part of. And then, as so what I'm sharing with you is on behalf of that team. Uh, there's a whole team of us who work together over these issues. And while I am the one with the silver tongue, I talk, there are many others whose work I represent. We call ourselves malaria maniacs. Um, if you uh, look at what we were dealing with, so I tried to ask the question, how big is the problem of malaria? I'm talking about 20 years ago, right? Um, at that stage, the uh, NVBDCB data was saying around 1,000 deaths a year. Other extreme was a million death study which said 200,000 deaths, 205,000. Uh, what's the truth? Somewhere in between. Closer to this or closer to that, depending on what your position is uh, on the spectrum. Um, but whatever the data you looked at, you found the bulk of it was from Orissa, whichever source you looked at. So this is 1998 NMEP data, where it says 24% of the malaria cases, 41% of the falciparum cases, 50% of the malaria deaths reported officially and it's very difficult to die officially of malaria, but reported officially, all of that was coming from one state which had only 3% of the population and 4% of the land surface of India. So we said, this is our problem. The solutions have to come from us. And we're not trying to make a noise. We're not trying to create trouble. We're just trying to save lives. So that's the perspective from which we were playing. And then like Bollywood would say, be sal bad. You're supposed to say that with Amitabh Bachchan's baritone. I don't have it, but it doesn't matter. Be sal bad. When you look 20 years later, you hear 19th of November, 2018, the release of the World Malaria Report in Mozambique. 
And the key finding is that while malaria rose across the globe, India's malaria decreased by 24%. And this was driven by an 84% drop in malaria in Odisha. Basically, if Odisha's malaria comes down, India's malaria comes down. I mean, it is very clear. So what's that story between 98 and 2018? What happened? And there are many, many stories built into this. So Odisha became the toast of the town. WHO hails Odisha as a role model for malaria control. Dr. Pradhan was there in Mozambique when the, uh, when the report was released. And the question, of course, is who did it? To my mind, the credit goes to the government of Odisha and to the state NVBDCP. They did a fantastic job. Uh, I think the leadership at the state was critical. I think these are lessons we need to learn. I'll come back to lessons later. But I have to mention uh, Ms. Arti Ahuja, uh, ma'am, uh, who was WCD secretary initially when we first pushed some of these ideas and later became the health secretary. She's the one who recognized the potential of the Daman strategy and pushed it through, got the permissions, got the funding organized from the government. And then Dr. Pramod Meherda, MBBS IAS, who was the health secretary who implemented and saw it through, ensured, uh, put the priority on the table. Every month we'd meet in, in Bhuneshwar driving this question, how is it moving? But of course, more than anything else, Madan Mohan Pradhan, who I think uh, there is no way to describe uh, the passion with which he transformed a, a, a moribund um, program team into a passionate, competent, capable team. And there's a story in there that I'll come back to later. But the malaria network in the field, you know, I don't know if you understand how much misinformation exists on malaria. So I remember going, you know, back in uh, 20 years ago, most people in malaria areas of the state believed that drinking contaminated water was what causes malaria. That was the common understanding. Right? The understanding of malaria was very poor. I can remember in Malkangiri in 1999, I was doing this large public meeting and a sub collector got up and uh, said, until today, I thought drinking water causes malaria. I'm not talking about some uh, people who don't understand. I remember addressing a convention on malaria in Bhuneshwar and a minister of the state said, when I'm on the campaign trail to avoid malaria, I drink mineral water. So this was an understanding right across, right? And until you, you can't sell mosquito nets if that is the understanding of malaria. So, but even at the health department level, I can remember one day in our district, many years ago, uh, the collector was holding a uh, health meeting. I said, please, sir, give me five minutes. I want to give an understanding of malaria to the team. And I started off and I talked about Anopheles fluviatilis. And the ADMO of the district, MD General Medicine, said, Tap, this boy doesn't know anything. Anopheles causes malaria, fluatus causes filaria. You know, <laughs> that was the, uh, the level. You guys in the research wing were talking high funda malariology, but the people who matter on the ground uh, didn't have the understanding. And what they managed to do in uh, Daman is actually to get a malaria down to the block level. People were passionate, knowledgeable, understanding, and therefore able to create local strategies. Uh, that's a big part of the story. And of course, the people of Odisha, a lovely population which listens to orders. Uh, so uh, a population that works very well with this kind of a strategy. And of course, you have to admit some unknown climatic changes and secular trends. Whenever malaria goes down, we take credit. When it goes up, we blame the weather. But there has to be some truth in that part of the story as well. Um, so that, I think, is what happened. And the government of India sent a letter to the government of Odisha, health secretary, health secretary. And I'm grateful because Dr. Pramod Merda then forwarded that letter to me to say um, thank you for your little contribution to this larger process that we were playing with. So we want to learn from history. Two high points in community malariology. 1961, the NMEP success point, 50,000 cases, and Daman 2018. And if you look at both of these things, um, what strikes you is, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not able to get it to you. He has made something. Okay, sure. What is common to both these points, besides the scientific knowledge, the appropriate tools and all, there is something very clear about both these points, and that is passion. If you talk to any of the malaria workers of the old time malaria time, my uh, metal uncle was a malaria worker in Tamil Nadu somewhere. Uh, I'd go home when he was 90 years old and he'd ask me about minimus and fluviatilis and culis of species. There was a passion they had. Again, in Daman, you see that passion. 
And I'm suggesting that we need to bring back passion to public health, to research, to malariology also. And I'm hoping that this will help a little bit in there. So this is the story of a personal obsession with malaria, but also the role of civil society organizations, which is often an untold story. Uh, and it doesn't matter. We are not looking for credit, but sometimes there are lessons that are worth sharing. So I'm going to take my personal story. I grew up in Velo, uh, 93. That's my wife uh, completed a master's in nursing and I completed my MD in community medicine. And we moved to Bisankotak in 93. In 94, I was working with the Mitra primary health program. We put a notebook in each village. We called it the Swastya Patta. We asked people to record births, deaths, pregnancies, and diseases. Diseases finished the notebook too fast, so we just shut that down. And we said, let's look at pregnancies, births, and deaths. We are still doing that. So we have access to data from 94 to now with a very basic verbal autopsy, but some information which is enough to actually create perinatal mortality rates, um, stuff like that you can create out of that database. It's very simple data. But at the end of one year, it was very clear that one third of all our deaths in the community and in the hospital was due to suspected or confirmed malaria. And we were focusing on immunization for diseases people didn't have. Diphtheria and pertussis were unheard of. So we were investing our life energy in the problems people didn't have. And for what the people were dying of, all we had to offer was chloroquine and DDT spray. And it was not getting anywhere. So we asked this ourselves a question, all of 95, we, I, besides everything else we were doing, the big question was, how do you solve a problem like malaria? Searching for answers. And that's where I came in searching here, touching the feet of gurus saying, please teach us. Dr. Orlov is the first person who told us about nets, treated nets, and uh, gave me my first talk of artemisinine from <laughs> Vietnam. He had some uh, for the patients who didn't respond to quinine. All at MRC and uh, VCRC, British Council and Care were running a NETS program in Kyonjo district uh, through SAGs. We went there. I took a whole lot of tribal leaders there in November 95 to learn from them. And out of all this, we understood some key factors that would determine the strategy that would work. One, over 95% of the malaria in our region was reportedly and surely falciparum. Usually 97, 98% of district data was falciparum. Your story changes if you're a wife. This is changing now. We're seeing maybe close to 50% five x now. So this game changes. But at that time, falciparum. You know falciparum kills. You know uh, the likelihood of chloroquine resistance even then. And uh, so the game changes enormously. The second huge factor we learned was that our predominant vector was Anopheles fluviatilis. So flowing water breeder, perimidnite biter, anthropophilic. Immediately, the game changes. Uh, we learned, we knew, of course, that our population was predominantly from the tribal community. We did sleep surveys to see what people do at night. Where do they sleep, uh, you know, which, which becomes critical to a strategy that works. And we also learned that there were tools. In those days, they were called impregnated bed nets. That was not such a nice word because it <laughs> confused people. Uh, then they said ITMN. I prefer the word MMN. MMN. We call it medicated mosquito nets. It's a much nicer word. Oh, yeah, we say, oh, uh, it, it didn't threaten people with words like impregnation or uh, treat uh, insecticide. It was a nicer word. So that's what we use. And MRC had published quite a few papers on the use of neem oil as a repellent. So those were ideas we pulled. I have a whole file of all these published papers printed because we didn't have net access. Everything was hard copy then. And this is uh, the team which came from MRC to us, Dr. Batra, Dr. Mittal, and four uh, technicians who came and uh, helped us look at the malaria in our area and find our way back in 96. So in 96, with all this understanding and in discussion with the villages, we moved to what we call the people's movement against malaria. Can you trigger people's response? Every family has to protect themselves. Every village has to control malaria. This approach, because there is only so much a hospital can do. There is only so much a government can do. Ultimately, the responsibility at 12 o'clock in the night when Anopheles fluviatilis comes to bite will be with the mother and the father. So that was the question we were asking. And our aim was to empower individuals and communities with the knowledge and skills necessary to control their malaria. And this was based on a malaria education campaign and three tools, medicated nets, neem oil, and chloroquine in those days. We worked with this. Now, remember, in my community, out of the 38 villages, nobody had seen a mosquito net before. There were two villages, there were a total of 15 nets who had mosquito nets. So there was nobody else 
um, no tribal person had seen a net at that point in time in our villages. So how you strategize if you're introducing nets newly or you're introducing medication of existing nets, it's a totally different selling strategy, right? So somebody told us this is called social marketing. We hadn't heard the word before that because we had no funding. We took one lakh from the hospital as a loan, bought mosquito nets from Raipur, and we made deals with each village, right? You please give us back our money in installments within six months. That money will be used for the next village. So, you know, we became gurus of doing this stuff because there was no funding. And uh, we did this from 96. We started, we're still doing it. From 96, we started doing this. Every six months, you redip your nets. Uh, a single net was 100 rupees. That is 90 for the net and 10 rupees for the uh, delta methrin. And a double net was 130 plus 20, 150 rupees. People paid back. You say six months, it'll take one year. That money comes, you rotate it to another village. So this is a strategy we used. It was people had never seen a net before. So how do you get there? You had to take the nets out to the community. You had to allow people to sit inside those nets because they want to know, can I breathe inside? You get our staff to go, the male staff to go tie a net in the night and sleep in the net and invite the uh, village leader to sleep inside the net as well. He never slept so well in his life. Uh, for the women, the USP was put your head against the net and sleep in the morning, your headlights are dead. Uh, we, we learned to market uh, the idea in the terms that people would use it and everybody dipping their own net, medicating their own nets. So we did this in different ways. And some of the principles we learned was social mobilization and demand generation. No demand, no supply. Because whenever demand pressure, uh, su sorry, supply pressure is more than demand pressure, people want to know what your ulterior motive is. So creating demand before you supply. We learned that IEC was mostly propaganda. Uh, you go for education, for empowerment, where people are empowered to take the choices. They have a choice. They may use it for fishing. That is a choice. Uh, but you have to allow people to have the choice to make informed decisions. And then community pressure holds it together. Cost recovery through installments, circulating the fund available, and community participation at every stage. So we did this in 96. And in one year, 97, that's 100 years since Ronald Ross, one year, malaria crashed. The fever cases came down by 30%. The fever deaths decreased by 36%. Hospital admissions for the malaria came down by 50%. Dr. Orlov came and visited us in Bism Uh And he took my internal papers and he published it in the uh, WHO Regional Forum in 99. I don't usually publish in scientific journals. One, I don't know how to do that. I write more Reader's Digest style. So it gets published in general media rather than uh, in scientific journals. Uh, but this was the first one which came out in uh, 99. So 90, we realized we'd stumbled on something. And group after group came to us saying, please teach us, what did you do? NGOs, various NGOs, Prem Plan, Ocha, different NGOs came to us saying, please teach us. And the job was to demystify malaria, was to disseminate the message and empower others to respond. My wife, my son and I were traveling on the train from Bone to Chennai. My son was little. There was a young lady sitting opposite. She was playing with my son. She made the mistake of asking me, uh, what are the problems of Orissa? I gave her a lecture on malaria all the way till Chennai. I didn't realize she was an IS officer on probation. But two, three years later, she calls me up saying, I'm Chitra Armagam, I'm the collector of Malkangiri. Uh, do you remember me? You lectured me on malaria. I said, oh my God, you didn't tell me. Yet. <laughs> and that gave rise to a program in, Mal in Malkangiri in 1999. Um, and the, the tagline was, I cannot afford malaria. It's cheaper to get a net than to get malaria. And it was so different because she would, uh, She'd uh, ask us to, you know, she'd cancel the movies in the theater. There was only one movie theater in town, Bhagirathi Theater. And uh, they'll announce on a mic, today there will be no movie, there'll be a class on malaria. And then you have to perform for 400 people and you better be good at your communication. You know, you had to hone your skills because communicating in a movie theater is very different from communicating in a conference hall with a committed audience like you. And they're on wait for you. <laughs> uh, and so I'm gonna try and show you a trick in the communication because I found researchers are usually not the best communicators. Uh, some of you are, but I mean, forgive me for saying this, but I found very often we're very good. The people are very good at searching for the information are not necessarily very good at communicating the information. So may I cheat and ask for three volunteers? And I'll show you how the, the malaria, the, the, uh, the uh, malaria geology can be actually interpreted. I realize there's a camera problem, doesn't matter. Can three people please come here just for half a minute? I promise you won't have to sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> Just any three, just come here because then they can see. 
any three Maybe people can please come. <coughs> no problem. So I'm trying to. I need one more person. The same. Can you just come to the yeah. same? Face this way, ma. Face yeah. this way. I need one more person, please. Come. So, okay. So then you come to the room, and can you just stand here? Okay. So this is how you teach the epidemiology of malaria, right? For malaria to occur in a village, this is to you can do this in a village. You can do it anywhere. For malaria to occur, you need three players, right? The parasite. Can I take your hand? The female Anopheles mosquito <laughs> and man. Yeah. Post. Where these three meet, there is malaria. Where these three don't meet, there is no malaria. How much malaria you have in an area depends on how much parasite you have, parasite density, how much mosquito you have, vector density, how much, oh, sorry, sorry, vector density you have, and how many people you have, population density, and how often they meet. So when there are all three in abundance and they're meeting regularly, you get Bisam Gautak Chandrapur, whatever, Gachiroli. Yep. <laughs> when you have bits of them meeting occasionally, you get Delhi. <laughs> right? And when you don't have one of these, you get Switzerland. Yep. So if you have the parasite and man, but no mosquito, there's nobody to spread it. You have man and the mosquito, they bite each other, but there's no malaria. And if you have these two without the man, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> All right. So what is malaria control? Malaria control gives you three options. Either you hit the parasite. That's diagnosis, treatment, early prompt, prompt treatment, EDCT, uh, vaccine, all of that is sitting here. That's one option. Or you hit the mosquito. All the source reduction, vector control, everything is wrong here. Or you can hit the man. But <laughs> <next one. laughs> what you do is <laughs> behavioral change. You keep him away uh, from the other two. So all the personal protection measures are here. Now, when you explain this to a panchayat, to a sarpanch, to a village, they come up with their own malaria control strategies. That's empowerment. You give them an understanding and the tools necessary, and they can do it themselves. So I have done this. The first time I did this was in a movie theater. But I've done this now under mango trees all over the place, and it works perfectly. Right? So... I'm sorry if I break the rules of lectures, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so the ways in which one can actually um, communicate, right? So you can use this and then you can go into entire vector biology. Yeah. Um, the whole, I call it mosquito psychology. You know, uh, why does this mosquito bite us? And why not the male? Why only the female? Usually the females are the nicer people. I mean, no gender statement there, but I mean, the species, why? So people want, people ask you these questions. You have to be ready for these questions, right? Inevitably, somebody will ask you, uh, why should I take primaquin? When you're doing a public meeting, it is not controlled. Anybody can throw any question at you. And so you have to be ready to explain the life cycle. So we Bollywoodize the life cycle. I've done the life cycle with 2000 people listening. You know, uh, because you, you can make it in a way in which people understand, because otherwise you can't explain prime quick. Um, and so you play this. And the way it is taught to us in medical college was such a tragedy. It was so boring. And for some reason, they split the cycle between the sexual cycle and the asexual cycle. It's a dumb way of, of teaching malaria, uh, the life cycle. You know, all the boys in the back row suddenly wake up. <laughs> and then you say, no, you're a parasite. They go back to sleep. You know? <laughs> but... <laughs> You, you can make it interesting because once that happens, people are able to participate. The power shifts from the doer to the beneficiary. And malaria control requires that to happen. Yeah? So in uh, 2001 to 2003, in a district called Gajapati in South Odisha, a group of NGOs, Prem Plan and 16 NGOs, pulled us in to try and help them. We looked at under five children. And as a baseline, every under five child was offered a malaria test. Look at those numbers. 15,676 tested, of which 35.8% were positive for malaria. This was microscopy, RDT had not yet come at that stage. And then we started working with those children to see how we bring it down. But this gave us a word. We called it the point prevalence of malaria parasitemia in children under five, or child parasite rate. 
The advantage of focusing on this group was that you bring down mortality at the same time, under five mortality at the same time. Uh, this idea expanded to 3,500 villages in seven districts, and we were the technical uh, side. None of them had doctors, none of them had nurses. We were the people who provided the technical part of it. They were the legs and the hands, and they did a fantastic job with this. This went on as you keep on. See, research is not necessarily a project. Research is an attitude. It is a questioning. It is critical thinking. In around 2007, we were looking at malnutrition in our area. I found six children who were severely malnourished, and I brought them into the hospital to find out why on earth are they malnourished. Four out of the six were positive for falciparum malaria. We treated the malaria, the weights jumped. We put them on chloroquine prophylaxis, their weight increase continued to rise. Suddenly we realized that a lot of the malnutrition we were seeing was actually due to chronic or recurrent malaria. We call that mal-mal. Alison Demborath is the one who first came up with that word. Malaria-induced malnutrition. We started treating uh, malnutrition medically. And the change was amazing. Again, I don't do research in the common sense of the word. We're not doing projects. We're trying to save lives, but we're documenting everything we do and then mining that data in retrospect. Just look at the 74 children who were losing weight on, at an average of 29 grams per month. You treat them for malaria and put them on chloroquine prophylaxis and they were rising by 325 grams a month. We also gave them a course of cotramexazole and flagyl and we gave them some iron and folic acid. But as long as the chloroquine prophylaxis was continuing, they were uh, increasing weight monthly by around 325. At the end of three to six months, if you graduated the children and took off the chloroquine, their weights continued to rise, not at 325, but an average of 182. It told us that maybe the word nutrition is fooling us to think only food. And that the nutritional status is more important. Again, like I said, we're numerator people, we're also input people. As a country, I think we're input people, not outcome people. We get so obsessed with the inputs, and this is what happens in nutrition as well. So around 2010, the Tata Trust discovered the problem of malaria, and they came to us, and uh, we started the uh, Malaria Resource Center to help NGOs in South Odisha. And this worked across four districts, at one point, 1,51,000 uh, population, 630 villages, through a network of NGOs, Dapta, Far, Swati, and the Gajpati NGOs, uh, with Tatra support, where these ideas could now get, uh, get played out across a larger platform. And the baseline in under five children in all these areas, if you look at those numbers, you realize ranges from 22% to 61% uh, or 62% positivity in children under five. Yeah, but if I just take the data from our own program and look at this data, this is 2010 and we do it during season, which means between July and October. Uh, out of 1,245 children tested microscopy at that time, 730 or 59% were positive. Now, if you disaggregate the data, it was fascinating. Out of the 730 children who were positive, 92% did not have fever. Only 8% had fever. The national guidelines said if you have fever test, you will miss 92% of the malaria. Oh, is that malaria or not? People told us, why are you bothered about that one? If the child is happy with his parasite, what's your problem? But it is not asymptomatic malaria. It is a febrile malaria because the, the, the child might be anemic. The child might have failure to thrive, the child might be malnourished, and of course, fueling, fueling the transmission in the village. So we started looking at that, of course, all of them got treated. We found that the point prevalence of malaria in children increases with age. Zero to one is the lowest. One to two, three to four, the highest comes somewhere around seven to eight. And then it seems to plateau. We saw there was no gender variation. We saw that there were certain villages, you could look at a village and say, this will be 70%. There are features of villages. And we had seven villages which were 100% positive. Each of those get treated. We're also doing nets. We're also doing neem oil. We're also doing health education. And you're doing this on an annual basis uh, in each of these villages. So the strategies we were using were what I call education for empowerment. And the way to communicate malaria or any infectious disease is to use the four question format. What is malaria? How does it spread? What should I do if I get it? What can I do so as not to get it? And whether I was training doctors or whether I was training uh, tribal villages, you use the same four formats. 
Medical people will always be interested in questions one and three. The general population is always interested in questions two and four. Two and four is what makes the difference. If they understand transmission, they understand the mosquito, and they get the tools to protect themselves, you become irrelevant and unnecessary. And that's the way it should be. From there, we went on to the second strategy, which is saving lives and decreasing suffering. That is ensuring treatment was available at the village level. Along with that came what we call the Mal Mal camps, which are every year, each village, every child was offered a free blood test. The parents, of course, know what's going on. Everybody lines up and the positives get treated and you watch the data. When RDT came in, we switched, switched to RDT so that it could be done right there. And there's a redip counter for mosquito nets at the end of the line. Always when you do this in a simple line approach, the, the poke must be in the last, the blood test must be in the last counter because no child will cooperate you, with you after that. Um, and then you have whatever you can do for reduction of vector density, mainly for secondary vectors like uh, Culis facies, because there's nothing you can do about free vectors anyway. And every village is built next to, next to a stream. So our lives were just perfect for a flu atlas. And then you look at behavioral change and personal protection measures. We use neem oil, we use medicated mosquito nets. And one of our partner NGOs, Dapta from Bhavani Patna and Kalandi district, they came up with this idea of, can we do innovative mosquito proofing? We called it improof of village houses. If you can fill the gap between the, you know, the eaves gap between the wall and the, and the roof, and if you can put net on the doors and the windows, if there are windows, uh, can you actually reduce the number of uh, mosquitoes? And, you know, in the whole PMJAY, when we are making housing for the poor, if only somebody who has the year of those that matter could ensure those houses are mosquito proofed, I think we'll make a huge difference to all vector borne diseases. I don't have that level of reach. I'm a panchayat level fellow. So if any of you have that reach, please do it because we are making housing for the poor anyway. Let's just make those mosquito proof. The difference between mosquito proofing a house and using a mosquito net is like the difference between in contraception, using uh, intrauterine contraceptive device and using OCPs. Mosquito nets requires motivation every night. Proofing of house is a one-time motivation. And therefore, I think it makes sense to do these things. These are ideas from the field. And then, of course, measuring change, sustaining uh, the process. But if you look at the data, and I want you to look carefully at these numbers. Um, so in 2010, we started this process with 59, 58.6% of the children uh, positive malaria. You repeat the same village on almost the same day each year to get rid of seasonal variations. It's, everything is clustered between July and October when season because we were trying to save lives. I just want this child to survive this season. That's all we were looking for. But when you look at the data, we found 10 to 11, it, there's a sharp fall, 59 to 33. Then there's a slight fall, 33 to 27. Then there's a sharp fall, 27 to 11. Then there's a slight rise, 11 to 15. Again, a slight rise to 20, a slight fall to 18. Now look at the next line. When we started working in that area in 1995, our under five mortality rate was 295. The next year was actually 350. So around uh, 300 per thousand. Look at it from 2010. When there is a sharp fall in child parasite rate, there is a sharp fall in under five mortality all cause. A sharp fall, then a slight fall. A sharp fall, then a slight rise. This you see exactly the same. In other words, all cause under five mortality in a malaria area directly correlates mm. with the point prevalence of malaria parasitemia or the child parasite rate. And all age fever death rate also comes down. So this was what we presented to the state again and again and again. And if you look at the trend with all the other partner networks, we were getting about the same kind of a trend anyway. So in 2010, uh, we had a Mal Mal workshop in Bhuneshwar for NHM where we presented this data saying, look, this is what is happening. We've got a tool in our hands. Uh, if you can sanitize the population of parasites, it looks like it makes a difference. Uh, people were skeptical. 2011, when we represent rep the same thing again, everybody, that's when um, uh, Madam Arti Ahuja was uh, secretary WCD, and she said, wow. If this decreases malnutrition, then I'm really interested. We start looking at malnutrition differently, different conferences in Bhuneshwar which came on. The idea of Daman germinated. Daman uh, means pressure in Odia, but the full form is Durgama Anchildra Malaria Nirakana, which means uh, eradicating malaria in remote areas. This was Dr. Madan Mohan Pradhan's um, 
name that uh, he put to us, and both of us actually developed the original concept. 2015, comprehensive case management project ran in four blocks of four districts with the um, uh, test, treat, track strategy. It was also showing similar results. By 2017, Daman actually took off in June, July. And I was on the CCM of GFATM. There was this 1 million nets coming to Odisha at that time, which kept getting delayed. In retrospect, it was perfectly delayed because the nets came in April, June, Daman ran out in July, and the cumulative effect of these two at the same time is what resulted in this graph of the government of Odisha. This is an NVBDCP graph from the government of Odisha. Red is 2016, and if you look at the, level, uh, the green hill, you realize it's actually higher than the previous year till July. And suddenly, this can't be chance, suddenly there's a sharp drop from July onwards. By December 2017, you're looking like at an 80% reduction month on month. And in 2018, there's no hill, it's plain. This graph, you know, is amazing because this was a story of what the government of Odisha did in 2017-18. You have to hand it to them. And if you ask me what are the key ingredients of that miracle that occurred, that public health miracle which occurred, to me it was passionate and competent leadership combined with scientifically sound, reality-rooted strategies, a provision from Global Fund and the government of Odisha funding this enormously, combined with the intervention tools which were decentralized access through the ASHAs to diagnosis and treatment at the village level, which is already in place from 2013, plus the LLI and strategy which took off in April, June 2018. They did it extremely well, the distribution. And uh, then the Daman initiative, which was a state-specific initiative to sanitize. The idea was sanitize the village of the parasite. If you can do that, then even if the mosquito bites you, you're okay. But combined with nets, combined with IRS, combined with everything else, it just brought down the critical density that made the difference. So remember, malaria control is not permanent or reversible. This is 1961 all over again. We are privileged to be part of this moment, but if we let go now, history will not forgive us. Right? All of us in community medicine studied what went wrong in 1961 onwards, and we said, in, uh, what mosquito resistance, parasite resistance, and resistance of the system to change, right? And everybody got their PhD for that. So let me now finally share insights of our community malariology from this journey. One, mass screening and treatment of positives as a malaria control intervention. It's a viable intervention. It's a cost-effective intervention. It actually works. And two, the overwhelming presence and significance of asymptomatic or afebrile malaria. Uh, in Daman, it was around 77% of the positives were afebrile. In our data, it was 92%. Whatever it is, this is critical. And that's what forms the logical scientific basis of the Daman thinking. Three, child parasite rate as an objective indicator of malaria endemicity. API measures staff performance as much as it measures malaria. Yeah, I remember once telling the then Health Secretary Meena Gupta, if I can reduce malaria to zero in the state within six months, just break all the microscopes uh, and you'll get zero. You know? So what are we measuring? What is the validity and reliability of what we measure? It has a lovely key if it is done correctly. right? So when the denominator is all the children or all the village, you're more likely to get a better in indicator. So we suggest child parasite rate. Uh, for the learning I want to share with you is MALMAL, the link between malaria and malnutrition, an idea that we've been playing with since 2010, that if you can take out the malaria, you liberate the growth curve of the child. Five, the link between child parasite rate and under five mortality rate. It seems in malaria endemic areas, that seems a direct correlation. And six, communication models for malaria education, the four question format and breaking the triangle. So my humble reflections for young malaria scientists, you have no idea how lucky and privileged you are. I'm so jealous of you guys. You have access to information, you have access to funds, you have the opportunity. Don't waste it. Because to whom much has been given, much will be asked. We are accountable for the opportunities we got. Number three, go to the people. Because till you share the pain of people affected by malaria, you will not get it right. So take time to go and sit in the community, sit with a family whose child died of malaria. That will then teach you the right research questions, the real research questions, the ones that make a difference to the poor. 
and then pursue the translation of research. You know, treated nets today we say is the best thing which has happened to malaria control. But look back in the 80s, Gambia had done it. The Africa had done it. By 1990, VCRC and MRC had published papers on the efficacy of mosquito nets. Um, RS, uh, Sharma, RS Yadav, Sampath, uh, Field Station, Rorkela, Control of Malaria in Bisra PHC, or VCRC in Dulagura in Jaipur. They had published papers by 1991-92. But we took it up as a nation 20 years later. Who is responsible for all those who died in between? You and I, as a scientific community, have to realize that we have to move from the lab table, from the research to the thing. And I want to remind you, you can make a difference. You are relevant. You are precious for what you do. We just have to be the change we want to see. To NIMR and Mira India, thank you. Thank you, sir, for a lovely journey of all these years and actually a glimpse into the field and the real malaria communities. And uh, in all these 25 years, you have summarized in the last slide on four points. What do you think are the most important take home message? And there's a mix of uh, malaria epidemiology and where all the crucial indicators and what what did matter at that time. And where do we you know, see it as a future? Now we are sitting at a very important, we are at the cusp of elimination. Now that's not, our targets are not very far. 2027, we are supposed to hit a zero case. So it's like five years down the line. So I think there must be some questions, Bhavna, in the chat box. I think it appreciates free messages. Appreciated messages. I pay commission to a lot of friends to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So you can be, I mean, uh, online participants, please feel free to ask any questions. Otherwise, I'll start shooting my questions. Then others may not have a chance. So I don't want to use this position to do that. So please take any, any I mean, ask it, feel free to ask any question. Otherwise, I have a set of questions. Okay, by the time they are thinking of their questions, sir, I have two or three questions to you. Uh, so you presented uh, malaria and malnutrition nexus, and you did this study uh, 2007 to 9, where you give chloroquine prophylaxis and saw their nutritional status picking it up. So currently, when malaria is so down, but malnutrition continues to be a problem for India, we are faring very poorly in global hunger index, our UNICEF reports, and even the NFHS survey show a high prevalence of underweight stunting in everything. Malnutrition is everywhere. M malaria is going down so and you said okay i mean we see malnutrition from the point of food give i mean uh, undernourished is leading to malnutrition of course now what do you see should be the policy in the specific region where malaria also is high malnutrition also is high and prophylaxis is not in the government policies yeah. no i am not recommending prophylaxis today i don't do it today um, my argument is in, in public health, in medicine, we play what I call the naming game. Once we put a label on an issue, we stop thinking. So I'm arguing at the point of the child, this child is malnourished. Yeah? Why is this child malnourished? This will vary from child to child, family to family, area to area. In some areas, malaria could be the part of the component. So in fact, we moved from comparing a child to a graph to actually weight change. In my team, what we do is what is the weight this month? What is the weight next month? So weight change divided by uh, uh, the gap in days into 30 gives you a rate of weight change per month. Yeah. So we, because growth monitoring is different from weight recording. So I think conceptually we need to revisit some of what we are doing now. Uh, but the reasons will obviously be different. Today, we don't see that kind of Kaushikar and Marasmus we used to see yeah. 20 years ago. If there is that kind, it's always a disease underlying, like tuberculosis or something, or a social um, crisis, mother died, uh, something like that. But what you're seeing is a different level of malnutrition. I agree, compared to the rest of the world, we're behind and we need to focus on that. But I'm arguing, don't stop thinking. My problem is that we keep, um, we so easily uh, prefer formula to thinking. 
and if a government order comes from the top, then we just follow it without thinking through, whether it is in malaria or in malnutrition. And since the word nutrition is there, immediately we go off into food. I think food is definitely part of the therapy, the therapeutic part of it. But the etiology of malnutrition, I'm arguing, we need to keep looking at it again and again in localized situations. And those are very often, sometimes social, sometimes medical, very often nutritional also. But I fear that we don't think adequately in public, or the people who think are not the ones who are doing it. There's a gap between the ones who, who are doing the thinking about etiology and malnutrition and the people on the ground who only follow orders as they come from above. We are capable of more than that. As a country, I think we are capable of much more than that. So I suggest, I'm only saying that in malaria endemic areas, that is also one of the reasons for the malnutrition. It is obviously not the only reason. When malaria went down, malnutrition did not necessarily go down the same pattern. Absolutely. What occurred to us in Odisha was there were 16 districts that were high burden for malaria, and the same 16 districts were high burden for malnutrition also. So I'd say taking out the malaria liberates to a certain extent, if, if the other factors are in place. Sir, yeah. Yes, sir. So I think a similar analysis, similar, I mean, an analysis of malnutrition districts and malaria also were done by our team. We have found similar uh, results. High malaria, high malnutrition, they will correlate. So are you suggesting that we have Anganwadi centers where under six years children are being given food and giving some primary education? So maybe in high malaria endemic region, these uh, Anganwadi centers, they can just do a screening of the children. Maybe they might be asymptomatic malaria. That can be one strategy. I mean, prophylaxis is not recommended by government, but at least uh, screening and testing can be done of asymptomatic children. And Anganwadi centers are the perfect place to capture this, this population. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that for the malaria parts of the country, uh, malaria parts of the country. looking for malaria should be an active process as mm -hmm. part of the protocol. So if, whenever a child downgrades, moves into red zone or when a child is not responding to uh, to food the the right. feeding in the anganwadi center there must be infection it makes diseases. sense and if in the malaria area every asha has that rdt in their hand it's just a question of giving permission it's a very simple solution there just say you don't have to have fever to test if it is in the case of a uh, malnourished child Right. I think it makes sense. Right. I think, and, and just to then treat that, uh, because we have to accept that just because there is no fever, it is not a nice thing to have your child having parasites floating in their blood. Not acceptable, to my mind. So again, that will require a little shift in the policy of testing. Correct. So you're coming from civil society and you have experience of the field. That's why you are saying uh, testing an afebrile child should be put into policy and uh, ASHA worker should be you know asked to test the child but the i mean the program and the national strategic plan the, even the recently revised ones again as i said earlier in, the, in that room also sir if the, the definition of malaria case people with fever children with fever those are the ones which are getting tested so maybe now we need to think in certain different ways the government needs to look into the data in a different way and capture the asymptomatic people which maybe our research body needs to prove that asymptomatic people this is the quantum of malaria and this is the malaria they are transmitting as well yes but yeah I, I think so because i think i'll come the other way around hmm. if i was a person working in nutrition very clearly, part of the protocol of managing a child with malnutrition includes ruling out Testing infection. Malaria. Yeah. Ruling, in, ruling, out, ruling infection. out infection. Whatever is the common infection in that area. That might be TB in some areas, it might be malaria in some areas. So if malaria is otherwise also endemic in that area, to not test, to not uh, test a child with malnutrition doesn't make scientific sense at all. Right. Sir. Now, how does that come into a protocol? In Odisha, what we did was Pushtikar Divas, that is the 15th of the month when all malnourished children are supposed to be referred to the PHC for their workup. We just introduced the MP as part of that workup, regardless of fever. It became part of the malnutrition workup format. Uh, so I think we have to find the correct way to push that through. But it's not just about malaria. I'm saying each child is different. Different. We yes. have to ask why is this child malnourished and chase that down. Keep lateral thinking, never allowing our brains to stop thinking because there's a protocol. Absolutely. So my next question, like you have been working in this area from past 27 and a half years, and now you have, you must have seen a total shift in the etiologies of uh, morbidity and mortality and the shift in the age pattern in general of infectious disease and of malaria. And that shift is genuine because, of course, Odisha decline in malaria is historic. 
it is celebrated across the world and it has found a place even in the world malaria report and as you said odisha ka malaria drop hua india ka malaria drop hua so is this sustainable and the pressure of daman and i mean in the sense all the strategies are working towards decline in the malaria do we ease the pressure and the malaria will come back do you see that i i think that's the biggest danger now and two reasons for that uh, there is a price to success um and i think the danger of thinking we've arrived you know malaria control is not like nirvana it's not a permanent state uh, and uh, i think we've already eased off partly because of covid um two years we got mentally covidized uh, all programs uh, you know backed off and i think um i think it's coming back i think malaria this year is more than last year it's not like before but if we don't move now we could just do the 1960s story all over again what the difference now is we have a strategy that works we just need to play that strategy and we'll be there so uh i think we are in danger of slipping back uh at least halfway part of it people will say oh yeah this was going to happen in malaria anyway every 5 10 years this happens so you just rode the wave and claim the credit uh, partly true also i think that's fair we can't deny that part of it will be there but i think a lot of it the graph is too sharp a fall to have happened by secular trend uh, and therefore i think we have the tool and we'll have to work on it. but to let go at this point would be very very dangerous i think we would lose uh, so much so i don't think i think the parasite is smarter than all of us put together uh and therefore i think we till the vaccine comes we have to keep playing uh, smarter uh and and i think the critical issue is to be willing to look at the truth of data i'm afraid that too often we are scared of the truth and therefore management information systems become information management systems the single most important requirement for a good mis is the desire to know the truth and if there is if there is you know if you're free and frank in looking at the evidence then i'm sure uh, we will respond in right time and i think we have the tools now we have the people it's just a question of keeping on being vigilant and responding as it breaks so my last question then others may ask so where do you see the place of civil society and organization like yours and many others in the malaria elimination plan in total as a country and how do we engage with them yeah um i think that civil society is a very generic word it ranges from a small club in a village who is very good at being the hands and feet for program implementation but may not be in the position to ideate and you have at the other end anybody who is not government is called civil society i'm not saying government is uncivil but what <laughs> what i meant is uh there are also huge amount of scientific minds which are outside the government system at the end point we are all here for the people of our country to see everybody else as partners uh and leverage cherry pick according to the strength of that organization for that place but to leverage those strengths i think is absolutely sensible so some people in the civil society are in a position to be able to ideate maybe they have the technical uh, understanding to be able to do that take that contribution there because they may be free to say and do things that it's difficult to get done in the government right the, on the other hand on the ground if you want to implement very often there is a whole army of civil society organizations not all are good but many many who are actually sincere and really want to make a difference and very often have the rapo and the ground connectedness that could be very useful so we need to mix that up uh, and um, but essentially to say if we want to eliminate malaria we are going to need everybody let's not pretend that you can do elimination of malaria only if you can get coordination between the research group and the program itself would be a fantastic thing no uh, there itself we have a problem because all of us are not necessarily on the same page it's good to have alternative thinking it's good to have different kinds of thinking uh, if everybody thought the same it would be boring but i think that if we are going to reach elimination we are going to have to expand the portfolio of the people we are willing to work with and civil society actually gives you that last mile con- last mile connect which very often it's difficult when it comes through the government to my mind you need both 
You need the top down and you need the bottom up. And somewhere malaria gets squeezed in between them. Malaria is too smart a disease to get fooled by one way tactics. So I think we need both. Hmm. Yes, Praveen. Yes, sir. So good to listen after long times. Sir, if you, I just, I want to know your experience in terms of like, if you go to 10 to 15 years back, when that time you are doing the practice in hospital as well as in the community, that time the ratio of the clinical malaria turned out to the personological malaria and what is current situation? The clinical malaria turned out to the personological malaria. Now, if that question is based in a hospital, yeah. uh, what percentage of clinical malaria is backed up or, or will come positive on microscopy or on RDT? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or on RDT? Um, that time, like in 12, 13. Yeah. yeah. See, right. those days, I think, I think also those days we didn't have any other tests. Yeah. So every fever, unless otherwise proved, was malaria. You know, you remember the old yeah. yes. postcards used to have that sign, no, fever could be malaria, take chloroquine. And for, I don't know what, who justified this, but for some reason we used to give only four tablets. And when you ask questions, they said because Indians have immunity or whatever. Um, the presumptive stage in life. Uh, today, I think we are aware of a whole lot of other causes of fever as well. For example, I think scrub typhus is a big one. Mm. It's not on the radar. Nobody's picking it up. We are seeing a lot of scrub typhus. And the season of scrub typhus is the same as the season of malaria. The same July, August, September period of time mm -hmm. uh, that you see scrub. Dengue is on the rise everywhere across the world, I think, or uh, at least Southeast Asia. Uh, there are also the other ones like chikungunya and leptospirosis and all. So the, I think today we are looking at fever very differently. The undifferentiated fever or the acute febrile episode, what you're looking at now, you have tools now to pick up many things at that time we didn't pick up. So what you would have called the gap between clinical malaria and parasitological malaria could have been made up at that time by other diseases, which we were not picking up and we were calling at that gap. Uh, we don't have PCR and stuff to find out whether. Uh, so uh, today that gap is smaller. I must also say that um, in the... Uh, 2017 18, we stopped seeing malaria in a hospital where we used to see tons of malaria. 17, 18, 19, we hardly saw any. 20, 21, we are seeing some cases, 22, we are seeing a little more. So it is there, it's not gone anywhere. It is there, it is down. Uh, but I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question properly because I think that gap has been cut down by the uh, knowledge, awareness, and access to diagnostic tools. Uh, to eat into that gap. So I think there are a lot more other causes of fever now, which we're picking up and that, that, that's a good sign. Asymptomatic malaria, I don't know yet because we stopped doing mass. Uh, one, once Daman started, we all just jumped into Daman. Uh, but recent evidence suggests that malaria is coming back and in children, it is there. So we just, you know, are seeing more malaria in school children in remote areas. Main road areas, not so much. So I think it is a warning that if we don't, get our act together, we might lose. Sir, sir, very good presentation. Can you tell me? Yes, absolutely. We were in Tamil Nadu, so I had to do something so, sir, I want to know when you talk to people or people, to change their leadership quality and their thoughts. And with one person, 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 ये है कि I think हम लोग जो MBBS वाला है हमको वो ये problem है कि सब बोलते हैं हमको कि अब भगवान जैसे हैं कुछ दिन के बाद हम लोग विश्वास करना पड़ते हैं शुरू कर लेते हैं कि हम भगवान जैसे हैं दिन कर बड़े जाते हैं I think simple चीज ये है कि we don't know I call it the humility of partial ignorance communication के लिए सबसे important दो चीज हैं नम्रता और आदर 
if you don't have respect for your audience, whoever that audience may be, and if you don't have the humility of partial ignorance, that is to say, what I'm saying today may be disproved tomorrow, then har cheez mein gadbar jate. So I feel that in public health, that is very important. That what we know is far less than what we don't know. Aur bhoot sari cheez hai sikhne ke liye. Jis cheez humko MBBS mein sikhaya te, aadha cheez abhi irrelevant hai. The truth will keep moving. And we have to still be true to the truth you have today. But with the humility of the knowledge ki bhai, hum bhi limited hai. So I think that's extremely important in medicine. Um, fact is that very often patients will live longer than the doctor. Yeah. So, sir, can we, as you see, Daman is a big success, right? And can we adapt this kind of you know, study in other states? Maybe it's difficult, right? I would say you have to see every strategy, uh, you must look at where it is. Yeah, I remember in the old days when we started doing nets, people criticized us saying, uh, I mean, Malkangri, we were criticized saying in Rajasthan it didn't work. Yeah, those days, I'm talking about 99, uh, nets were not yet accepted and they said, ha, oh, Rajasthan it didn't work. But there you were dealing with Stephency. If you're dealing with a first quarter biter, uh, last quarter biter, obviously nets is not your answer. I mean, in, in, not your main answer, use nets. But for a fluidless area, a perimidnight biter, there's nothing like nets. Similarly with Daman, my argument is, I don't think it is one size fits all. Subject to the malaria, the, the, the epidemiology of malaria in that place, you need to actually fine tune these ideas. But what essentially Daman says is, can I, in an area where I cannot do anything about vector density, in reality, huh? uh, with Fluviatlas, IRS is there, I agree, but you can't do anything about source reduction. Uh, our areas are just designed for Fluviatlas breeding. Uh, reduction of um, parasite density to subcritical levels is critical and where asymptomatic or afibrin malaria is so huge, the only way to do it is to use this strategy. I think where that is relevant, the one will work. It also depends on being a community which listens to you. If you try to do the same thing in an urban area, people may not respond to that way and then it doesn't work. It works only if a vast majority of the people agree. So I think we must never get so married to our methods that we lose sight of our goals. A lot of the problem in public health is that each of us is so possessive and obsessed by the methods that we developed and therefore we lose sight of the goals. It always has to be the goal. The goal is helpful. Uh, and if that is clear, then whichever route works here or there. So I wouldn't implement it across. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it across, but I think to ignore that strategy would be foolish because it, uh, it, it has relevance at least for some areas. Babna, you can go to the question uh, box. Right. So Dr. M.M. Pradhan was on the chat. He has left for a meeting, but he was truly happy to hear your talk. He's written there. And Dr. Abdesh Kumar wants to ask a question. He has joined. Sir, good afternoon. Abhna, you announced Dr. Abdesh Kumar. Dr. Abdesh Kumar, sir, can you hear us? Yeah, 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 Dr. Manju. Good afternoon, sir. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, sir. Am I mm -hmm, audible? Yes, yes, sir. How are you, Dr. John? I'm fine, thank you. So nice to hear your voice after a long time, sir. And the same here, sir. <laughs> for listening for listening to your, I mean, pleasurable description of last 25 or 27 years. Thank you, sir. So thanks very much for sharing those community level details, which we often forget at the national level. Yes, I, just, I just, I mean, taking a cue from your statement that if the malaria declines in uh, Odisha, then the malaria declines in India. So, so my silly question is, in your opinion, by what time Odisha would be able to eliminate malaria? 
political question sir <laughs> not not at all not at all i am not a political person <laughs> no, i was i was joking sir uh, i honestly think elimination is going to be very difficult i honestly think that um, part of our problem right from the 60s has been that whenever we start succeeding uh, the <laughs> prioritization goes down because obviously there are other bigger priorities you know when everybody else is dying of something of covid how can i sit there and uh, chase the mosquito no so i think that has already happened to us uh, that um, public health priorities move on and unless we actually keep our foot on the accelerator continuously uh, with a specific team which will be able to do that and not get uh, sidetracked into another priority i think we may lose uh, at a national level i know i know it is incorrect to say that elimination will not happen i hope and pray that it happens but i have serious doubts uh, because malaria has a way of some of finding its way to me till the vaccine comes elimination in our kind of a society will be extremely difficult i think we'll be able to bring it down significantly i think we can hold it down to a less than uh, public health problem kind of a level if we are really really effective in what we do Uh, we have the tools we have the information there's so many more new tools coming up technology is coming up uh, to hasten diagnosis treatment interventions everything but the human factor uh, is the part that is very often not something you can uh, dictate to all the time so sir i'm honestly uh, as a non government non scientist non everything i would say um, elimination time frame by 30 i don't think it's going to happen honestly forgive me i think we should work as if it's going to happen yeah i think we should work with the conviction that it will happen but i would be pleasantly surprised if it actually happened really close to sapphire so uh, so just i mean going i mean further on that <laughs> so this is absolutely non political yeah <laughs> uh, so by when do we expect <laughs> I, I i'm i i would be i would be worried about trying to put a number sir I mean, you give me the vaccine and then i'll tell you <laughs> see back vac- see vaccine we are still not sure exactly yeah that's right. vaccine is for younger children so just that's my question so we got a new disease called covid yeah and then and we vac- created more vaccines than we could use every vaccine producer is now searching for a market absolutely no? so it's very clear who gets the disease determines where the resources are you know malaria happens to the wrong people right uh, so until you know we, we just have to find our way there and since we are now the vaccine makers for the world i i, I mean i'm not saying it's only a question of resources there are other issues i understand that mm-hmm. so, but I, i don't see how we are going to reach elimination unless you know you have a large movement that occurs concentrated in places reduction absolutely Uh, control absolutely total elimination i hope we are right i would love it if you are right sir other countries did it china did it sri lanka did it and china, china you really like don't know size. china you really don't know i, I forgive me but i'm not sure that's what my worries about it most of places that did it i know sri lanka did a fantastic job i understand that sri lanka is a better example for us i think smaller but still smaller, yeah. uh, so I, I, we are such a varied country no and we honestly we really don't know what is going on in many parts of the country in terms of malaria because the data is not necessarily absolutely true uh, so we would need sir i have always said we need neutral umpires uh, sorry sorry we need neutral umpires in public health that means we need neutral umpires when india and pakistan play cricket the umpire cannot be from india or pakistan right we have to cultivate non health department data sources to use as external uh, you know for triangulation of data so right. it can come from the education department it can come from the forest department wherever but we have to find ways to uh, track those sub because otherwise uh, we may have blind spots in our system and then elimination will not occur in elimination every case matters every single patient counts um so i think we are far better in a far better position now than we were 10 or 20 years ago there's no doubt about that fantastic amount of progress has occurred far beyond what i imagined i'm a pessimist uh but um for us to go the next mile to push it further down it's going to need a far more concentrated strategy uh with external data sources 
because unless we have those, we will not be absolutely sure that uh, uh, we are actually uh, we are on the track that we think we are on. So you'll not like to put any date for elimination of malaria I, in Odisha. I mean, I'd love it to be tomorrow also, sir. But <laughs> I wouldn't be honest if I for Odisha or India also. Uh, I think the the problem is really really complex. So despite all your provocation, he is not putting a date on it. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I just wanted to. Yeah. I mean, what is the ground? Actually, my question was more. I mean, to get an opinion. Yes, sir. I mean, from some mm -hmm, expert who has been working at the ground level, and that's true in a tribal area for last maybe 25, 27 years. So it was actually, um, as Dr. John said, is it a political? No, it's not political. It's a ground level question that what is felt on the ground. Number one, is it feasible or not? Number two, uh, can it be done without the vaccine availability? And number three, um, if it is feasible, how many more years we would take? if it is not feasible by 2030. So I that was the objective. So, yeah, I think the good part of the story is that we've come a long, long way. From where we were to where we are now, it's fantastic. It's unbelievable how much control we have managed to achieve through everybody's inputs and uh, weather and everything put together. Uh, but um, the last bit, you know, once the low hanging fruit is gone, the high hanging fruit is going to be much more difficult. And I think to, we should not fool ourselves into thinking that the same trajectory in which it came down from X to Y will be the same speed at which it'll go from Y to Z. That I have my doubts. I think you need far more, it's far more difficult to win every point once you get closer to the goal. This is true with neonatal mortality. It's true with anything in public health. And I think the low hanging fruit are over. And we've done a fantastic job of that. But the high hanging fruit is going to be much more difficult. So uh, that, that's my take. I, would, I, I hope I'm wrong, but that's my take. I would still say that still we have low-hanging fruits available. That's also there, yeah. And they're coming back also. Right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. So sir. nice to see you, sir. Thanks. Dr. So Madan, Madan Pradhan has a comment on the chat box. We need data and data, both epidemiological and vectors. Uh, that all our planning and implementation will fail. We have a small window period where our existing tools can be used effectively. So essentially it's a race against time because Correct. resistance in vectors or resistance in parasite is just around the corner. I mean, even though we are not recognizing it, ACT resistance and resistance to synthetic pyrethroids. I mean. So, so the data that your groups generate, the ICMR groups generate from across is extremely important. Because, um, you know, whether it be vector data or uh, parasite data, clinical data, I think it's very, very important across the country. And that needs to be triangulated against program data. Yeah, th I think that's a key point, sir. It has to be triangulated against the national program data and there should be acceptance by the na national program of this oh, data. Because ultimately we want elimination. Sense. Ultimately we want elimination. We're all in the same uh, team. It's, it's a that's question of right. different uh, strategies. Again, sorry to interrupt Dr. Manju and Dr. John. Yes, sir. Uh, just one small comment on the data. See, we already have a lot of data lying with us. A lot of data. So there's no doubt that we require more data. We require more, actually, I mean, concerted data, no doubt. But the question is, whatever data we have, are we looking at that data or not? Correct. That's correct. But real time, sir, as we're going along towards elimination, yeah. it'll have to be real time. Real time. Uh, yes. I mean, there is no denial for that. Absolutely. But my only point is we must, I mean, start making it a habitual or making it a habit. I mean, that whatever data we have, we must look at it also. Yes, absolutely, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I think you highlighted a very important point. It's across many diseases for India. We collect more samples than we can use. We collect more data than we actually analyze and use it effectively. And we, we really need to look into it. And real-time data and very sharp data analysis and looking into those interpretations 
and india being a vast country it has to be very local focal the data from a particular place will not be applicable to other places right. my right. only argument when someone says this against i mean it's not actually i mean pessimistic comment here we eradicated the diseases when there was no computer available with us yeah <laughs> right so so it depends on the strategies I mean, actually, there is no denial that the real-time data is not required. It is required. But more than that, it is the action on the ground level which is required. Yeah, absolutely true, absolutely. sir. But this new digital tools and real-time data will act as a catalyst. It will just, it will give us a, a better leverage to work in the well, field. We know the outbreak is happening. It is simmering. We know real-time data rather than knowing after a month. We know the cases are building up. We will be able to take better actions. And the more accelerated action, sir. So the developed countries without any antibiotic, without any vaccine, eliminated, eradicated so many infectious disease, TB and all those in Europe are, not, are unheard of from 100 years. They have done it, but we should take advantage of the new tools and accelerate our processes and become a, a much, it can become more smarter system, sir, with newer tools. Very right. Thank you, sir. So I think it's thank you. Important. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I have heard that the increasing proportion of Vivax in the six district. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so it's really, really interesting. Uh, okay, I must say one thing. In our area, we didn't know we had malaria till the first team from MRC came there and picked up some. Okay, but it's still a small number, but still we didn't even know they exist because the I will not see what the mind does not perceive. No, um, but yes, the proportion of Vivax undoubtedly is increasing, and that again complicates the control strategies. Uh, you know, when we teach it to public, we call falsiparam bada bhai and uh, Vivax chota bhai. So we say bada bhai can kill you, chota bhai harasses you. Uh, so the strategy now becomes difficult you know, because the Anopheles is female. For gender balance, we made the parasite male just uh, <laughs> to make the communication nicer. Uh, I think this is complicating the story. I think there's a lot more Vivax now than before. I think that's clear from all the data. It appears that the strategies we're using are better for falciparum than they are for Vivax. Uh, or for some reason, when you see that proportion shift, uh, it, the falciparum numbers have come down faster, the Vivax numbers are not coming down like that. So is the issue related to hypnozoids and uh, and so on? Are we looking at um, better drugs required, better diagnostic tools required? I'm not sure. But because at our level, we are not able to make out whether this Vivax is a relapse or a fresh uh, reinfection. Uh, but uh, those tools are going to become very important. I think, I think one of the big questions we're going to have to look at is strategies that will work for Vivax. I, compliance, is compliance is also an issue. Taking Primocrine for 14 days is a bit much. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you put in the G6PD question uh, mm -hmm. to that, where, uh, you know, in falciparum, uh, it sounds terrible, but in falciparum, taking Primocrine was social service. It really didn't benefit the person, but it benefited society. And there were, when there is a risk, to the person in case you haven't mapped your G6PD, then uh, one gets worried about how much I should take, especially with that 45 milligrams, everyone gets scared of. And you have to convince the person to take this. <laughs> if they come in 2.5 milligram tablets and it's a bit much, you know, 18 tablets you would take in one shot, it's quite hard to convince anybody. And you have to promise them it's absolutely safe, which you're not in a position to promise. With Vivax, the dose is less, but the duration is longer and compliance becomes an issue. But I think we're going to have to think specifically of Vivax strategies of how this is going to work. Of course, NETS is fantastic because then you work on the personal protection measures. It doesn't matter whether it's Vivax or Falsman. But at the treatment level, at the sanitizing a village of parasite level, I think Vivax is going to be far tougher than Falsman. And it's showing. It's showing in the data already. Recently, we just did a few, a few school children. And I was very surprised, you know, one village has got more Vivax than Falciparin, another village has more Falciparin than Vivax. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but I think there is a whole lot of stuff we need to look at more carefully. Undoubtedly, Vivax is going to be our problem in elimination. So there is Vivax and untreated Vivax, even these vector control tools won't work if there's a relapses. Mm -hmm. It'll there's a self-perpetuating infection Correct. in itself. Correct. So there's no role of vector there, but the continuous 
Vivax infection and then transmission. Things we don't know how much of the Vivax we have, we are the relapses, yes. and how much is there. There is no way to know whether it's a relapse or a reinfection. Right. We don't have that kind of robust diagnosis. So there's still a lot of the stuff we don't know as yet in that area. And I think so much of our attention went to falciparum correctly to decrease mortality. But now for elimination, I think a renewed focus on Vivax is going to become very important. Say the belt you are working in, is it there's a G6PD deficiency there? Uh, the uh, NIRT people, 2.6 percent. NIRT and people have done some surveys there. There is some there. Sir, as you said, uh, the, the elimination will be a challenge uh, with the existing tools. So we still are focusing on you know all that uh, things to the uh, tools available to us for elimination of malaria. And you said that there will be challenge. So can you, uh, you know, uh, tell us about something you know, we extra should be doing to achieve that? One is a strategy like case-based surveillance we will do when the the it number comes down. down. But uh, it is self you know. Uh, Propagating again if we lose our efforts. So, what uh, kind of a uh, you know permanent efforts we should be making in a, in a new you know, generation now? So, I think the, the first I'd like to say is that the existing tools also we have not utilized fully. Tell me, if I want an LLI, can I buy one? Why, after all these years, is LLI still only supplied by government and not available in the market? I can't understand this. Right? In days before LIN, I asked the question, can't we sell uh, deltamethrin in shops? And they said, no, no, it is an insecticide. But I said, that same permethrin is what they're using for medical, yes. for head lice. And if that can come in a sachet, why not this? South Africa was using uh, KO tabs. It was as a tablet form. Thailand allows you to go into a shop and buy antimalarial. Somehow, the control of malaria has always been the property and the responsibility of government. I think we have to break that. Government will continue to do what it is doing, but let the public also do what they have to do. Ultimately, public has to take responsibility for their help. So jet, good night, all out are making a killing on malaria protection. But we are still holding on to the best tool. So one, I feel that access to tools has to move out so that anybody who wants to buy a net can also go and buy a net. Why not have LLIN in the market? I can't understand why that has not happened. There must be some reason. Forgive me. If I... Also, that if uh, you are API less, less than something, then you won't have LLIN. Yeah, so let's, I can understand where the government is supplying. You have to prioritize who to give to. That I understand. But why hasn't the private market picked up? So I'm not saying government must be selling in the public. The private market, I can't understand if all the repellents sell so well, right? With I have no shares in any company, but I'm saying if they sell so well, why isn't the best tool, far better tool than any of those? After all these years, we are looking at 40 years since treated nets. You know, you look at net gain and all those guys, 40 years since we knew that treated nets are probably the best tool for self-protection against malaria. And it is best done by a person at home. Uh, why isn't that? So I'm arguing, first of all, that the tools we have still have a lot of potential for utilization. It's not that we've saturated utilization and therefore we need new tools. Along with that, the search for new tools, the search for information, because resistance, insect resistance is going to be an issue. Delta methrin is used for cotton cultivation everywhere. So, uh, if we, we should make a demand to the public actually because it is imposed uh, by the you know, government. So, maybe you make compliance, there are so many issues for that. But if you make them you know, realizing that this is a very essential thing, or... no, I'm saying ultimately there has to be individual and family responsibility for health. So we did a couple of meetings at ICMR headquarters for raising this demand of LLI and being available over the counter. I mean, people, I mean, companies should be able to just sell it on a chemist shop or some, some shop there. And in fact, we've written a paper also on it that it should be made available in the private sector. I mean, there are South Asian countries where you can access it and even in Africa. So, but again, sir, uh, aligning policies to the needs of the people and even to research evidence, it takes some time. Yeah, and maybe, with, I mean, out of Desh Kumar is still online. Yeah. So that that brainstorming has to be done within the program. I also wrote a detailed email to Dr. Tanu Jain, current director, raising this issue of availability of LLN in the private sector. I have not heard from her before. She said, okay, she's going to discuss it within NBDCP and come back. But of course, they're also extremely busy with so many other work. 
So I mean, we can't also keep on chasing them with these ideas. And even we had raised the idea of availability of RDT in the open market. Why can't just people go and buy an RDT and test on their own? Of course, we need to link it to diagnosis and treatment by the government sector. Or we can we can crack a somewhere a middle deal with the RDTs. How with COVID, you made available antigen testing, you know, available to the people. And we have a pregnancy test available over the counter. We have a, for sugar check, you have acute checks available over the counter. Why not malaria RDT? I mean, we need to, we need to brainstorm on these ideas. Sir. So if that's, that's my argument. Elimination is possible if we include everybody, everybody. in the Everybody. Especially we have people everybody are affected, It sir. cannot be held only by one group and expected mm -hmm. because people can't, you know, people cannot just sit there and say government must come and put the tablet in my mouth. Government must come and put a net over me. Government, you cannot do that. People have to take responsibility. People, I think, are willing to take responsibility. Yeah. But we need to open this out. I think that, for me, airline has always been the issue because uh, when we started doing ITM and dipping every six months, the redip was the problem. And wherever you look in the world, the reimpregnation rates are always low because as long as the control to that access is, is in a few people's mm -hmm. hands, it is not going to reach the last man in the line. So Gandhiji's whole question, you know, whenever you make your strategy, ask yourself what difference will it make to the last person in the line? And I'm afraid uh, when we control supply, uh, the last person in the line is not going to get reached. It's not going to reach sir. So there are many things like this. So two things to your question, sir. One part is ensuring that we have utilized the existing strategies. I'm not saying you do one after the other. Utilizing the existing strategies to the maximum, I don't think it has happened as yet. Uh, I sleep in a treated net. I've slept in a treated net since 96. Um, and uh, I have access to it. I don't have access to LLN, but I have access to a treated net because I can redip my net every six months. Um, but everybody else is not able to do that. Uh, and LLN is such a fantastic tool. It's such a fantastic tool. To hold it back makes no sense. At the same time, if you could get a vaccine, I don't think there's anything like it. Or newer technologies which allow a... Uh, easier diagnosis. So all the things we're reading about AI and stuff, uh, where you might have a test for malaria which does not involve a prick, that would be fantastic. Uh, it would just change the dynamics of the game so much. Uh, so uh, diagnostic tools that are portable, accessible at the last uh, last points um, and reasonably accurate, I think that is going to be one area. Uh, the medicine we are totally dependent on now is artemisinin. Um, and, you know, we have to have another line in case something goes wrong with it. We, we know of resistance. So those, those are also very big research questions which have to come in. But I think far more than that, the utilization of the information, like uh, Dr. Adish said, utilization of data, utilization of tools, utilization of, I mean, it's not that we don't have. I think the gap between availability and utilization is still far too big and far too long to be acceptable in this time and age. And that's a real information is also one of the challenge, big challenge. Like one state is, you know, claiming we are about to eliminate. The other state is adjoining, is getting malaria from them. But then they have their own data. But how can we rely upon their data then? Because we have to generate our data also. But our, uh, with the program, they say that uh, your surveillance is not so good as we have a uh, large number of surveillance and we have a uh, lot of number uh, numbers in your sample size. So in that case, where the, you know, there is a competition mode to reduce the down the, the burden of the disease, you know, that may be fake also. But uh, we have to rely on their data. So that's why I'm saying we need multiple sources of data, not just for this. Yeah. You talk about infant mortality, you talk about maternal mortality, any issue. We have to cultivate multiple sources of data. And I'm afraid, you know, we can't use this methodology. If you don't like the message, shoot the messenger. That's not a good way to go about science. And therefore, cultivating multiple ranges, you know, it's like some other departments, you know, the public uh, water department, they say we encourage complaints because the more complaints we get, the better we are able to improve ourselves, bore well maintenance or whatever. In health, we are scared of complaints. I can understand because of various other reasons. But I think until we get, if you're looking at elimination, every single case will matter. And therefore, cultivating multiple sources of information from different departments, different groups, uh, you know, sentinel groups, whatever. Uh, once we come down to a certain level, that becomes necessary. Without that, I don't think we're going to reach that. But it can be done. You know, those are parts. We are the information country, you know. We are the kings of information. So it's possible. So is there a Bhavna, reason for the... Can we take some questions from the online? Huh? Sorry, we'll take that, take your question uh, once. 
you are done have any question on the chat box i see metal with a worsening situation for dengue especially in many cities which lessons in interventions from malaria control are relevant and applicable given the difference in the mosquito behavior and the differences real or perceived between rural tribal populations and urban populations yeah uh, i think that's a lovely question um i think that um, you know i used to say at one point i wanted to resign my job and uh, just get on there's a you know what we call trekkers jeeps which transport people from town to town i said i just sit on that and just talk about malaria on to everybody that is the best audience i'd get see the understanding of mosquito behavior so for dengue uh, aedes is a totally different behavior but until people understand it they can't protect themselves and you can't protect them you cannot protect 1.3 billion people so source reduction will still be an issue and with urbanization sources will increase because our sanitation is not fantastic <laughs> um in our place we had outbreaks of dengue which finally they figured out was uh, because people were not sure when the next water supply will come so everybody has a big drum in front of your house mm -hmm. and that becomes an issue so development uh, you know dr vp sharma used to say the uh, graph of green revolution and the graph of malaria in india are parallel as irrigation increased uh, malaria increased uh, for us it is the graph of development so called development or the graph of urbanization and the graph of dengue are going to be parallel because these are driven by these factors and uh, we, we we will have to look at those but i think the one commonality is that you have to see the population as your ally that you can't control dengue unless people want to control it so the methodologies if you look at the different states which do things i don't want to name any uh, political features here but getting people on your side for that people have to understand you have to share the information with people so for for me to know that the mosquito that causes dengue everyone's scared of dengue now cuz uh, it's got an aura around it and it's so dangerous i need to know that the breeding is usually peri domestic that it's usually artificial collections of water that what i thought was uh, an advance when i got my cooler inside my house could be the source of the uh, mosquitoes that understanding and that critically that it's a daytime bite uh, therefore my mosquito net in the night may not make a difference to this one those you know those parts need to be part of the story in malaria in my area wherever i went nobody knew that non fleas bites at night so when we talked about mosquito nets they said when i go hunting in the daytime what will i do so little bits of information are empowering and those information which seems to be very common for uh, you and me are actually life saving in the population sense but i think for this we have to understand see community participation was a word which was used for every uh, to satisfy donors you know if you didn't write community participation five times in your proposal you didn't get funding but it's actually a very not just a participation but community empowerment because ultimately it is their lives ultimately it is my child and therefore i think we need we are doing a lot of it with mass media and so on but programmatically we need to understand that uh, while we need to do our part as the agencies ultimately the people will have to be empowered to put their part without which we are not going to handle something like dengue so me that is a learning i would take across uh, that don't dumb down the population into thinking that uh, we have to tell them what to think you know mm. uh, but empower them with the knowledge and they will come up with the answers all this should be part of school curriculum sanjeev 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 i hope it can be done without vaccine all we need is evidence and implementation public health passion and he is that yeah. thing so i think uh, this was a wonderful lecture and actually uh, provoking and invoking our uh, thinking on the public health issues i mean basically nmr is a lot focus also on the basic sciences and the laboratory scientists and many of the field stations have joined but the field station people who are embedded in the in the field itself and they are dealing with the community sir i think all these messages resonate with them and with this younger generation of scientists also and so you have come a far away from 27 years experience in the field and bringing the lessons on the table what we also see in the field is from a different perspective
So I think it's very important till we see the history and how we have traveled all along and the future may, may, may become dark or bright depending on how do we learn from this lesson, sir. And I take your point, it'll be very tough and difficult to sustain the control and leverage on all what successes we have till now, till we do it so well and involving everybody. I think your last message was involving every stakeholder, including the people themselves and not dumbing them down. And that's extremely important, sir. So we really, really thank you for this lecture and a thought provoking. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. I'm totally humbled. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Sir, I know you are traveling, and so this is not a real plant, even <laughs> though we have been given real planters here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Just a small token from us. Thank you so much. I've never spoken to so many people, malariologists, before. I usually speak under mango trees to people who know less malaria than me. So I was very nervous speaking to you guys. You're all ustads, and I'm some jinko <laughs> from the field. But thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much.